Hello everyone, I'm Justice Graves and welcome to my channel and today is going to be the next video on my playlist on Robert's Rules of Order newly revised, the 12th edition, or also abbreviated as RONAR, R-O-N-R. You'll also see that on the title of the video. And today we are going to talk about in this video chapter one of Robert's Rules of Order newly revised, which encompasses sections one and two two sections one and two I just want to make that clear for reference Robert's Rules of Order have about 20 chapters and 63 sections so just that we're aware of that that is what we're doing this is going to be in a presentation like format as most of my discussions are and I do have some real-world discussion material to discuss with you on this particular video so I'm going to we're gonna look real quick and I'm just going to switch into it. And we're gonna get started. Chapter one is about the deliberative assembly, its types and their rules I'm gonna be presenting. And as you'll notice, if you look up in the upper, well, now I'm small, but if you look, I'm in a completely different corner. I'm in the upper right hand corner of the screen instead of the lower right hand corner of the screen, just so that I can be a little bit bigger and so that we can go through this. So, section one is titled The Deliberative Assembly. Um, before we begin, this is one of the most important videos on everything. We're going to be talking about precedents of rules, and in this video we're also going to be talking about the four fundamental entitlements or rights that an elected officer has and how those sort of play in to the situation. So let's look at that. And then after this video, just go to the videos that you need in order to understand the different parts of Robert's Rules that you might think are relevant. Again, I'm trying to make this easy. I'm doing this one chapter at a time or one section at a time if it's a really important section. So let's go back. Section one is the deliberative assembly. What is the nature of a deliberative assembly? A deliberative assembly is essentially just a group that gathers to enact action on behalf of a larger group of people. For example, an entire town or an entire organization, thinking of Lions Club International, etc. And these are, their, these are the characteristics of them. A group of people meeting to act or discuss courses of action to be taken in the name of an entire group. They meet in a venue under equivalent conditions of opportunity. What this means, and when we get into the four basic rights of a member of a deliberative assembly or a member in a board or committee, what this equivalent conditions allows for is it allows for everybody to know who is voting on what. It allows everybody to make motions on the floor. We'll talk about motions in a later video. And it allows people to hear and to respond to debate that's going on in an equal fashion. Really important that that is sort of a condition sort of baked into this is that people have the right to know and respond in real time. Members have the freedom to act within the assembly according to their own judgment. People can say yay or nay or abstain at their own pleasure. In any decision made, the opinion of the member present has equal weight as expressed by vote. If it's a group of five, every person's vote equals one. You know, one vote each. There's five votes total. Group of eight, you got eight votes available. Each person's vote is one, one-eighth of the total. If an individual member doesn't agree, so let's say it's a four to one decision, four people agree, one person disagrees, that doesn't constitute withdrawal by an individual member. If you're on a government body and you say no, it doesn't mean that you just, you rage quit to put more of a common term to practice, into, into use on this. You don't just rage quit, flip the table and leave. You can, you're, you're still there. It's not an automatic quit. That's not how that works. You need a full resignation for that. The present membership acts for the entire body in the moment of any action, because it is expected that there will be some members who will be absent or if they resign. Quorum rules do apply, however, as explained in section three of Robert's rules, paragraphs three to five. This is how the citations work if you weren't aware. Three, so this number in front, if there is a number in front with a with this symbol right here, that indicates, if you see this nice symbol, that indicates a section. If there's no thing in front, but you're talking about Robert's Rules and you see a colon like this, this is the section. 
These are the paragraphs. If there are parentheses in there, that indicates the clause. So for example, I've even seen, let's say it's section three, paragraph three, clause two, it would be parentheses two in there, just so that we're aware of that and understand the rules. But when we get to section three and section 40, we'll talk about quorums a lot more in depth. Section one continued, the nature of the deliberative assembly. An assembly is a group of people who gather on behalf of some cause or some established powers. A meeting is an event of the assembled members to transact on business, which is distinguished from a session. We'll talk about that in section eight, which is at a later chapter. Now, this is a citation that I wanted to bring up, and this will be brought up at the end. This is section one, paragraph four. Members of an assembly have the four four have the following four fundamental rights or entitlements. They have the right to attend meetings, meaning that even if, if you are a minority, and this is really important, in parliamentary procedure and in parliam parliament in parliamentary procedure and parliamentary law and in the studies of those, three really important concepts come up. The rights of the majority the rights of a sizable minority, and the rights of the individual. This is why you see that most actions take a majority vote, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then there's this thing called two-thirds vote, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then there's why you see this citation, because individual members have the right to attend, which means the way that all of the other members in a group, let's say it's a board of selectmen, or if you're in your state house, or on a committee or something like that I'm on, you have to be notified that a meeting is happening the same way all the other members get to know. You have the right to speak and, and if they don't do that, depending on the situation, that could void a vote. If you are a sizable majority or minority group, that could have stopped a motion from happening. So that's really important. You should know this rule. When people don't know about this rule, that it's your right to attend meetings and that people need to tell you what's going on, you end up becoming a victim of your own ignorance, especially when you don't know about these rules. And another thing about section 1.1 1 .1, paragraph four that's really important is that these, just because I'm saying to attend meetings, it means all of the meetings of the body. You can attend a subcommittee meeting if you want to. You can attend regular meetings or special meetings. Doesn't matter. You have the right to be there even if you aren't an official on there if you're a part of that group. It's the right of a member. You have the right to make motions unconditionally unless they're illegal motions on the floor, and we'll talk about how motions work in later chapters and later videos on this. To speak and debate, you can't be shut down if you're an actually elected official on something. If everyone's got two minutes, everyone's got two minutes, and you get your right to use your two minutes. If someone's making special rules, that has to be done by vote, or it has to be a policy that can be cited or a rule that can be cited. If there's none, and we'll get into precedence in a little bit on this video, you have the right to speak. They can't shut you down. There's certain powers that a chair of a committee or a president of a body can put in place, but that doesn't stop opponents from speaking. And you have the right to vote. You also have the right to not do any of these things. This is the other part of it. You as a member cannot be compelled to agree or disagree on anything that's happening. That's why an abstention vote exists. You can say, I abstain. You can rescind yourself. You can pull out of a conversation, walk away for a bit. All of those are legal, and it doesn't constitute withdrawal from a body. It doesn't mean a resignation. That's really important. The only time an individual member can be deprived of these rights is when they are the subject of a disciplinary proceeding, which is the last chapter, chapter 20, which we'll go over way later in these videos. The deliberative assembly, the nature of it, still a basic principle of the deliberative assembly, a board or committee, is that an action must be adopted by a majority vote, meaning 50 people plus a feather, 50% plus a feather, meaning direct approval. This implies responsibility for said action. It's important to say no when you don't agree with something, because if something happens legally and a vote happens and you were in the minority because you disagreed with it, you as an individual member, if it comes down to individual members were acting irresponsibly and that is what is decided, you as the member who said no to it are not held liable, but everybody else can be. 
just because you act on behalf of a town and just because you act on behalf of a state, if there is a really bad vote that comes up and something really goes down that's horribly wrong, and it's decided that individuals were, you know, it's at an individual responsibility level that people should have decided no, and it was very, very illegal. That means everybody in the majority affirmative, whether the majority affirmative was to not do the action or to do the action, is held liable for it. And so that's really important. And that's dependent on the cases. I want to make a point clear here that I'm not a lawyer, but that is generally, generally what goes down. Measures can require more than a majority vote when it's required by a law, required by a special rule in an organization, or when required under certain circumstances that impede the normal rights of the minority or an absentee. That goes back to the four fundamental rights that we talked about. If you have a minority that's over a third of the group, they can't shut you down in debate. There can be motions to do that, but if there's enough of you that say no, it can't happen. They can't stop you from voting, that can't happen. They can stop motions, but they can't stop you from making them. And they can't stop you from attending meetings. So speak and debate does have some qualifications in it depending on the situation, but these are almost completely universal and almost completely undeniable. But speaking and debate has some little qualifications sometimes that really depend on your chair and what's going on, etc., etc. There are times when a two two-thirds vote is required threshold for a motion to pass, and then there are times when a previous notice must be issued. A previous notice is a notice of a proposal to be debated or voting on. Briefly describing its substance, being announced at the meeting before it, or included in the call of the meeting, meaning the business of the meeting. Meaning that when you're going to vote on something, most things that you get to vote on if you're in a group, or if you're in a body, or if you're an elected official, you have to get told what you're voting on. And there are some things that can pop up at the meeting that are not expected, but most of the time, you're going to be voting on what's before you. There are provisions that if in 48 hours in advance, the chair wasn't notified of something that, they're, that now you're going to vote on, that's acceptable. But if challenged, they do have to prove that they didn't know ahead of time. They can't just put something huge for a vote that would normally require a previous notice. A vote is effective only if it meets the requirements for a quorum. Again, see section three, paragraphs three to five, and also section 40. There are five types of deliberative assembly, one of which is the legislative body. We're not gonna talk about that today. There's the mass meeting. It is the simplest form of an assembly. It is a meeting of an unorganized group that is open to everyone or everyone within a particular sector of the population, like a town, that focuses on a particular problem or question cited by the organizers with an agenda to take action on said problem or question. We'll talk about that more in section 53. The local assembly of an, un of an organized society, a local branch of an organized permanent society or a local club. Think of something like Lions Club International. The convention. I've been to a convention. It's an assembly of delegates. I know we've all heard about the constitutional convention often for a single session to vote on matters about a large society. If you know how the Constitutional Convention works, essentially that's convention. And then a board. Think of something like a town board or city council or school committee or school board. Those are an administrative, managerial, or quasi-judicial body of an elected or uh, made up of elected or appointed persons. They are usually the smallest form of an assembly. There are differences between a board and a committee. Boards have bylaws, committees by themselves don't. Committees can have policies and can be guided by law and statute, but boards can make their own bylaws and can adopt those bylaws. So for example, the town of Templeton, which I am not a government official for, has bylaws that are standing, and we'll talk about a real world example of that at the end of this video, but a committee, which is what I am on, has policies. In this distinction between a board and a committee, boards have, have bylaws that can also dictate how they vote, what constitutes a majority, what constitutes a quorum, etc. A committee usually adopts what's called rules of order, such as Robert's rules of order. And those rules of order bind them to what's going on, except when rules supersede. And we'll talk about that in a bit. In fact, we'll talk about it right now. Section two are the rules of an assembly or organization. This is just a basic thing. This is a really easy thing to explain. 
So basically, section two talks about what supersedes what, when, and why. So at the bottom, when you have a group that's very unorganized, you have customs or customary practices. But the moment that you get into parliamentary procedures or you start to adopt Robert's Rules of Order, there's also called the Modern Rules of Order. There's also called mostly for the Massachusetts, um, for moderators who are in the state of Massachusetts, there's a book of rules called Town Meeting Time that states and different, not states, but that towns also adopt as the rules of order for meetings. Another thing about boards is that they can adopt rules depending on the format. So in a normal board setting in the town of Templeton, Robert's rules of order apply. At open town meeting, when it's the full town and it's the annual town meeting or the special town meetings, town meeting times applies and any other special provisions that the moderator sets. And it's only the moderator that sets those policies not the board itself, although the board can set bylaws that then cannot be broken by the moderator. It's a whole other discussion I don't want to get into. But essentially, once you have rules of order established, customary procedures get chopped to the floor. And we'll talk about that in a minute again. And then there's special rules of order. If there's a special rule of order, it can override a normal rule of order. Bylaws are not break. So this is another thing, and this is why there's this box here. A motion to suspend the rules can be done with a two-thirds vote. If it's customary, a rule of order, or if it's a special rule of order that has the provision that it can be overridden. However, bylaws without qualifications to break them, and a constitution and or a corporate charter, depending on what is go what organization you're in, these can't be broken. You can't just do a two-thirds vote and say, we're not going to do the rules. You can do that in all of these other organizations. You can just suspend the rules and you can do something else completely when these are your most basic rules. But when you're on a board, such as a select board, you can get rid of Robert's Rules of Order, but then you still have to follow the bot. Let's say you just suspend the rules. Your chair doesn't have their powers anymore as given in Robert's Rules of Order, which is where it's described. You get rid of that, but you're still bound by the rest of Robert's Rules of Order, if you didn't specify that, and you're still bound by the bylaws. All bylaws still apply. If the chair has powers dictated by bylaws, you can't get rid of that. If there's a special provision that no matter what the chair is in charge of the proceedings, you can get rid of all of the other powers in Robert's Rules for a chair or a secretary or a clerk or a vice chair. But if there's powers in the bylaws or a constitution, those don't disappear automatically. In fact, they're unbreakable. And so hopefully that makes sense. So let's go into a real world quick analysis. At the last select board meeting for the town of Templeton, and shout out because April is going to get a little bit of a, a highlight here, there's a question, is a special town permit going to override the bylaw that was put in place with regards to bio sludge? We're talking about reclamation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's just has to do with gravel mining pits. Well, as we know from this little chart, bylaws are not breakable. You cannot make a motion to suspend them. And as we know from this little tidbit here, the paper sludge rule, which is Templeton's bylaw section 223-3, paper sludge in any form, including the biomass, whatever, is prohibited. So you can't break this bylaw. And this other bylaw means that you can put special conditions, even if this bylaw didn't exist, this other bylaw about permits for gravel pits and other types of permits says that the board may impose such conditions not specifically provided for herein as it may deem necessary for the adequate protection of the neighborhood in the town, neighborhood and the town. So it's another provision. Again, this is binding. It also does have a little bit of a caveat that you can do whatever you want, hence why the town years ago citizens put up a petition and said no paper sludge because they didn't want to leave it up to individual board members to figure that out for themselves. And these are the important citations that I want you to understand for this particular section, for these particular sections on this chapter. Section 1, colon 4, a member of assembly is entitled to full participation in the proceedings. They have the right to attend meetings, to make motions, to speak and debate, and to vote. An individual member can only be deprived of these rights through disciplinary proceedings. Section 2, paragraph 16, a special rule of order can supersede any of the rules of parliamentary authority, we just talked about in the rules of precedence, which, may, which they may be in conflict with, except when specified by a bylaw or another policy. 
Section 2, paragraph 21. Rules of order can be superseded by two votes, two thirds vote as explained in section 25, except for rules clearly in a bylaw or policy that has its own rules for how you suspend it. There can be such things as nine tenths votes. Rules and bylaws and policies cannot be suspended ever. They can't be. And section two, paragraph 25, if a customary practice is or becomes in conflict with the parliamentary authority or any written rule, including a bylaw, a point of order as discussed in section 23, that's a special type of event that can happen, citing the specific conflict can be raised. And then the custom falls to the ground, meaning that the custom no longer exists. Once a point of order has been pointed out citing the conflict, and it's very obvious that it's a rule of order it's in conflict with, or a bylaw or constitutional provision, that customary practice just doesn't exist anymore. So we're going to leave it at that. We're going to switch back over. And that is that. I hope that was very interesting. If you want, please go back a few seconds before and screenshot that clip of those important citations that I brought that I brought up because you may need those in the future. We'll talk about more on how other chapters are brought up in Robert's Rules of Order as we get through them. The next one will be on chapter two. There are several sections in that that are also critically important that we'll go over. Like, share, and subscribe. If you like this content, follow me on Twitter at Justice, J-H-G, it's not that hard, to find me on Twitter and share this around. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your viewership, and I hope you stick around for the rest of my series on Robert's Rules of Order and that you learn something. Thank you. I really appreciate it.